want everyone to voice past the queue. Thank all you guys for joining us again for our 9 a.m. service here at the Hollow Tower Hotel. Hope you guys are blessed this morning. Let us be a blessing to you coming to your household, through your phone, your electronical devices, whatever it may be. So at this time, we'll start our service this morning. Thank God. Good morning to all that are out there. Thank all you guys for the shares. Uh, likes, watch parties, all those things to share to get the word of God out there this morning. So at this time, we will have our inspirational message by our very own Connie Cuffin. After the message, we'll have our scripture reading done by my very own sister, Lashonda Smith Woods. And then we'll have the word this morning. Stay tuned. Let's get the inspirational message. Let's get our scripture reading. And then we'll get the word of the day. Come on, the word of the day. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Pastor Q and Word Movers, welcome uh, to those online and those here in person. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the long way. God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Exodus 13, 17. The long way. As his peers were promoted, one by one, Benjamin couldn't help but feel a little envious. How come you're not a manager yet? You deserve it, his friends told him. But Ben decided to leave his career up to God. If this is God's plan for me, I'll just do my job well, he replied. Several years later, Ben was finally promoted. By then, his added experience enabled him to do his job confidently and won him the respect of his subordinates. Some of his peers, meanwhile, were still struggling with their supervisor responsibilities as they had been promoted before they were ready. Ben realized God had taken him the long way around so that he would be better prepared for his role now. When God led the Israelites out of Egypt, he chose a longer way because the shortcut to Canaan was full of risk. The longer journey also gave them more time to strengthen themselves physically mentally and spiritually for subsequent battles. The shortest way isn't always the best. That's right. Sometimes God lets us take the longer route in life, whether it's in our career, our relationships, or our endeavors, so that we'll be better prepared for the journey ahead. When things don't seem to happen quickly enough, we can trust in God, the one who leads and guides us and takes us the long way for a reason. Amen. So when we go through life's travels and we are we are taking the long route through our relationships when we don't get who we like who we want that man or that woman know that he's taking us the long route for for a reason and he gives us beauty for ashes so when we don't get that he has a better person prepared for us when we don't get that job that we have to train somebody else for that we should have gotten know that he has a better job for us, and he, um, <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> he has a better job for us, and so we can relax in knowing that in our patience, he's going to give us the longer route for a reason. Amen. 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 <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. The scripture reading will come from Psalm. 20 verses 6 through 9 and that's Psalm 20 verses 6 through 9 and it reads now I know that the Lord saves his anointed he will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his might right hand some trust in chariots and some in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord our God they collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O oh Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Amen. 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 Good morning. Let's give everybody a hand. Praise God. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Our word and topic of the day, everything ties in, is uh, going to be about trusting God. The scripture said in the book of Psalms, some trust in horses. Some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. Um, when I was looking up the definition of the word trust, the word that Webster gave me was assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. One in which 
confidence is placed. Trust, someone sets up a trust fund, it's a reliance or future payment for a property. But I wanna focus on the one that says which, one in which confidence is placed. We're, we're in a time right now that you and I must put our trust in God. The Bible says one of the most popular scriptures of teaching in the Bible is Proverbs 3 and 5 where he says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Yeah, yeah. Lean not to thy own understanding in all your ways acknowledging him and he shall direct thy path. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for blessing us this evening with this morning with your word, Father God. We ask you to come through for us this morning. Bless us with the word, oh Father God, that we may be able to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to talk about my good friend uh, Abraham this morning because Abraham was one who had to learn how to trust in God. Let me teach you that God will teach you how to trust him by putting you in situations that force you to trust him. Mm -hmm. How do I know how to trust God? I know how to trust God because, for one, he has moved people out of my way that he, I can't trust. He has showed me that there are things in my life that I can't put trust in. A lot of times when you're developing a relationship with God, the first thing God begins to do is remove things that have become a crutch. Remove things that you trust in because there are certain things that you put too much trust in and it becomes a hindrance to your relationship with God. Are you one of the type of people that me, like me, when you're doing your money for your bills and getting everything together, you, you, you say, you know, I know somebody owe me 20, I know he owe me 40, I know this is coming in and it's similar. Somehow at the end of the week, all my plans with man don't come through. Amen. Somebody want to call me and say, listen, something happened. I'm not able to get you your money. Hey, something happened. I'm not going to be able to come through. Something happened. I'm not going to be able to get the ride. Something happened. I'm not going to be able to be where I told you I was going to be. And I get disappointed. You know why? Because I put my trust in man. I've come to a place right now. I don't put no more trust in man. I put all my trust, hope, and expectation in God because I know God can't fail. Abraham had to learn that the hard way. Genesis chapter 12, the Bible says, right after God created, had this relationship with Abraham, the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 12, there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. Right after God told him where he was going to bless him, there was a famine in the land. Let me teach you something about the people of God when you are a child of God. A famine in the land does not mean a famine in heaven. It means there's a famine in the land. And what happens when we run short in a place, we do just like Abraham. Soon as things get tight, the first thing we do is move. But the Bible teaches us in the book of Psalms to be still and know that I'm God. Yes, yes. Be still. Know that I'm God. But see, that's a two-part thing. In order for me to be able to be still, I must know and trust that he's God. In order to be still, I must be able to know about him because it's his word that keeps me still. Anxiousness and anxiety comes when I don't know who he is. The reason why Abraham moved because Abraham heard that there was a that there was food and grain in Egypt. So he says, you know what? I have to go where the supply is. So that means I have to remove I have to move myself from where God said he's going to bless me and I have to go down into Egypt. That's what the Bible teaches you and I never to lean upon your own understanding. Let me tell you, sometimes before you can get the blessing of God, you have already removed yourself. Soon as things get short, honey, but start to start to think up, conjure up ways to be able to make money. And sometimes you're in a season where God is just helping you to be able to maintain. There may not be an overflow, and there's definitely not a shortage, but there's a maintenance. Sometimes you go through a maintenance process with God where there's not a lot of over, you're not under either. You're in the balance. Sometimes we get scared, we're in the balance. The first thing we do, we panic and you say, well, it's time for me to move. Time for me to start putting applications. There's something that God is doing. That's why he wants us to be able to be still. It's, it's amazing that the changing of our finances will cause an individual to want to change their whole life. Well, God said it has nothing to do with your finances. It just has everything to do with me causing you to be still. I know the things that you need and want before you even ask. You have to get to a place where you allow yourself to be able to trust in me. Trust in me, meaning that you sit and wait. One of the greatest scriptures of teaching, and I'm, and I'm a little bit ahead of myself. When the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness, when he was being tempted 40 days and 40 nights, 
And he knew that Jesus was hungry. He says, Jesus, if you be, if you are the son of God, if you are who you say you are, won't you command that these stones be turned to bread? Jesus come back and he respond with, to him through scripture. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds yeah. from the mouth of God. Yeah. What, what, the devil, what the devil was saying was this. The devil was saying, listen, you have the power. I know that you have the power to turn stones into bread. And since you're hungry, why don't you go ahead and do it? Jesus' response in layman's turn was, I know that I have the power to turn stones into bread, but I'm going to wait on God. What, listen, let me teach you. You have the power to be able to move before God. But a lot of times, if you continue to move before God, you will never see the hand of God. Mm. Amen. If you keep moving before God, if you keep leaning on your own understanding, you're going to find yourself in a place like Abraham. Because in order for Abraham's plan to work in Egypt, he had to conjure up a lie and say that his wife was his sister, which really was his sister. She was a half-sister different mothers, same fathers, but it still was a lie. There's no such thing as a partial lie. For those that teach the Bible and believe that some of this is truth and some of this is lie, that can't be because there can't be no partiality in the Bible. It's either it's all truth or it's all wrong. Amen. Abraham had to conjure up a plan as we do because when we don't trust God, we have to lean on our own plan and conjure up something to be able to get what we want or we, we, we believe that God has us in the place where God is saying, hey, I need you to be able to figure it out. God never asks us to figure it out. If you understand the, the teaching of the Bible where he fed the 5,000, notice that Jesus asked them a question. This is not something that God does a lot of in the Bible. He does not do a lot of asking you any questions. But this particular moment, Jesus decided to ask the disciple a question when it came time to feed the 5,000. He said, where can we buy bread that we may feed all of these? He's asking his disciples the question. God asking his disciples a question. God, how can you be asking me who's all-knowing, omnipotent? How can you ask me a question? He said, where can we buy bread that we may feed all of these? Then the Bible goes down and says, this he knew, but this he was testing them to see how much trust and faith that they had in him. I hear people say sometimes, I have these questions, how I'm going to make it, how I'm going to do this. And I should just respond to God, hey God, only you know. I put, I put my trust into you knowing that I believe that when I pray, you already know the things that I need and want. How many of us understand that when we pray and God is silent, that doesn't mean to move? Mm -hmm. You move because you're uncomfortable. You're moving and you're leaning on your own understanding because just, just because you pray, that doesn't mean you're going to get an answer right away. If you believe that he knows the things you need and want before you ask, when you pray, you be still. You be still and you sit right there until he gives further instructions. But a lot of times we sit still, we get antsy, and then we go out there and borrow. The Bible says, I believe in the book of Deuteronomy, he says, listen, we should be the head and not the tail. We should be above and not believe. We should be the lenders and not the borrowers. Before, call, before God even comes through, I already got three people I can borrow money from. I haven't even seen this. I haven't even given my chance. I haven't even got up off my knees of prayer. I already have in mind plan A, plan B, plan C. And if those don't work, what I'm going to do at the end. I already have in my mind figured out if God does, I'm going to try this and try that. And if that doesn't work, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to be going to like wefixmoney.com or something like that. If he don't come through, she don't come through, I'm going to try to borrow enough money. Let me teach you. The trust of God is also allowing God to fix you because borrowers always borrow. They never get to a place where they stop borrowing. You show me a borrower and I'll show you five other people that they borrow money from. If you are a borrower, you borrow from everybody. You have ruined relationships because of your borrowing. Yeah, amen. And because you don't want to be fixed, you continue to borrow. Yeah. And when you call people, they know that you want something. Yeah. The problem is not that you are a borrower. The problem is that you're a bad steward of what you have been given. And that's why you always borrow, borrowing. You don't know how to prioritize. You put your hair, your nails, and everything else before you, you prioritize everything for you. And the reason you don't have 
to be honest, is because you don't give. Amen. I'm not just talking about tithes and offerings. The reason why you don't have it because you don't give. So therefore, the universe will have you believe the creator, those who call him that, it can't come back because you haven't, you haven't produced a flow. In order for something to come back, it must first be pulled out. You don't never have because you don't know how to be a good steward over what you have. So when God is not giving, he's trying to correct the behavior that's in you that turns you from a, a borrower into a lender. Amen. Borrowers will always borrow because they're not good stewards. He talks about that in the scriptures of teaching. He says, listen, I want to teach you how to be a good steward. Well done, good and faithful servant. I want to teach you how to be a steward. Cain and Abel, he was trying to teach how, teach them how to be a steward. There was two different types of stewards. We know that Cain was the one who gave God what he wanted God to have. Abel was the one who gave God what he deserved, and he gave him of his first fruits, meaning he took care of God first. And when he did that, he noticed that the favor. Let me teach you why I don't believe in people talking about sowing seeds because the, the, the manipulation to me of sowing seed is that I believe when I come up here and I give 20, I give 40, that there's money coming back. Let me teach you the money doesn't always come back. It's the favor that comes back. It's the favor when I go to the grocery store and they say, do, do you have your rewards card? I say no. And the guy whips out off his pocket and uses his reward card and scan and takes something off my bill. It's when I don't pay the price that everybody else is paying. I'm not looking to get the money back. I'm just looking for the favor that comes back. See, it comes back. You just got to be notified. Sometimes they put three sandwiches or two sandwiches in the bag. They didn't put more in the bag. Sometimes I got a two pieces, three, four other pieces in there. Sometimes at the register, they give it to me for the sale price, and it ain't even on sale. Call it skill and I call it failure. That's, that's because once, once I put it out, he says, trust the Lord with all the heart. He said, you have favor with God and with man. Abraham did not trust. Soon as the famine broke out, he broke out. Understand this. When you, when you read the Lord's Prayer and he said, give us this day our daily bread. Hold, but first before he said, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Abraham didn't understand what government he was under. A famine broke out in the land, but he didn't realize that he was on public assistance in heaven. So you got to get to understand what great teaching, what I'm talking about. I'm not picking, but bear with me for a second. We all know somebody on public assistance yeah. who pays $60 for rent. Yeah. And they get vouchers and things from the government. Yeah. That's a great teaching, but when I teach it, you're going to look at me as, oh, you're downing or trying to look down on people that's on welfare. No, I'm just trying to tell you that the, will, the, that the example of welfare is an example of heaven. Why can't my government in heaven work like your government here on earth? The benefits, meaning that because I'm on welfare, I get certain benefits. Because I'm a king's kid, receive the adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, there's benefits for being a king's kid. I'm on welfare in the kingdom of heaven. I don't pay like you pay. People on welfare, listen, we live in the same apartment complex, rent different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You make more money than me, I got more food in my fridge than you. <laughs> Benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same way in the kingdom. That's why he says, listen, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven because there's no lack in heaven. You must understand that when the famine broke out in the land, it doesn't mean that that's lack for me. God still take care of his people. Through, the, through this pandemic, God's people have been taken care of. With less, with less. And some of us haven't even been working. You're 
on welfare receiving public assistance from the kingdom of heaven. God providing for you in this time because the Bible says that God is not a man that he shall lie, nor the son of man that he shall repent. What that means is this. God says, I don't care what goes on in earth. You're a king's kid. They keep showing coming to America on BET. And I like it when Eddie Murphy calls home to his father and Zamuni tell King Joffrey Joker to send them some money. See, what was going on in Queens didn't affect where they was from in Zamuni. They had Zamunda money. They brought the Zamunda money to Queens. You got to understand when you're a king's kid, it don't matter what's going on in the land because the king will take care of his kids. Amen. Amen. But when you're not a king's kid, you got to worry about gas going up. You got to worry about the price of eggs and milk and bread and things like that. King's kids don't worry about stuff like that. That's why Jesus told them when he sent them out. He said, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow to take care of things of itself. Don't worry about what you should eat. Don't worry about what you should drink. Trust me, no, because when they was following him, he said, follow me right where you at. And the man said, Jesus, I got to go home and bury my father. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Right, yeah. Jesus, let me go home and let them know I'm leaving. He says, listen, anybody who follows out, anybody who puts his hand toward the plow and looks back not worthy of the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah, amen. If Jesus walked in right now and said, listen, let's follow me. He said, Jesus, I got to go pack a bag. He said, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Best type of vacation somebody tell you, just get on the plane. Like, I got to put my two weeks in. I got to let my job know, Jesus, I can't just follow you. Don't worry about none of that. It's already funded. That's why he tells us, which sometimes we misuse the scripture. The scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all things shall be added unto you. What that scripture basically meant is that when I'm doing ministry, God will always yes. provide yes. for me yes. when I'm doing ministry. What does seek ye yes. first the kingdom of God mean? It means do ministry. And if I'm doing ministry, God will pay me because the Bible says if a man don't work, he don't eat. The Bible also says that a workman is worthy of his hire. Yes. Preaching the gospel is a job mm -hmm. that you yes. get paid for. Yeah, you get you get paid to preach. But I'm not talking about me as a pastor. I'm talking about you as a disciple. Yes. God rewards you yes. for the preaching of the gospel. Yes. It ain't a 1099. It's the favor that comes along with it. Yes. Yes. God rewards his people. Yes. Listen, God. the disciples did not have a job. Their job was what? Distributing the word of God. Jesus says, if you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness, all these things should be added to you. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you should drink. Don't worry about what you're going to put on. He said, that's the stuff that the Gentiles and the heathens worry about. He said, for your father in heaven know the things you need to want before you even ask him. He's talking to those who do ministry. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says that a man's gift will make room for him. The reason why God has a reward a lot of us because he don't he wants you to get out of the place where you're uh, where you're comfortable not using your gift. The reason why I the reason why God allows me to have lack because I have a gift that I'm sitting on. How many, how many of us know that we're sitting on a gift, sitting on something that God has given us to do and we know we're supposed to be doing it? You know how many people I meet in this past the past few, I know I'm supposed to be a minister. I know I'm supposed to be a preacher. And they just haven't stepped out yet. And God allows them to be having to have lack. The reason why is because the gift that they have is going to bring them what they need. And God says, until you tap into it and start doing what thus says the Lord, I'm going to always allow you to be in this position that you're in. A man's gift for me. Listen, Jesus says when he left, he left some of five talents. Left some with two talents, left some with one. He says, I've given you the talent, but you're crying out to me, telling me what you need. He says, use your talent. Use what I have given you. Sometimes what God has given you is a bad pass. You got to get blessed by what I'm getting ready to say. Mm, people are paying other people for what they've been through. Get blessed. Because of your experience to be able to come through. God says, if you open up your mouth and let people know what you have been through. Amen. We always looking for God to rain down something from heaven. God says, no, give them what you have. Give them your experience for they overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the yeah. word of their testimony. Yeah. God says, you have your ministry. You're just not using the reason why you're, you're not seeing my hand or seeing my favor is because you have not tapped into your gift. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You know what you know you're not supposed to. Sometimes we get to a place where God says, you know, you're not supposed to be working for anybody. I hear that a lot. God says, listen, I need you to learn how to be able to move and don't be in fear and move in what I have given you and not be afraid. 
Abraham ran into this famine and then he runs into Egypt. He gets taken care of in Egypt. Then we understand the story that when Abraham went there and had to lie and say Sarah, which is his wife, was his sister, that God had to be able to cause a plague on Pharaoh's house to get Abraham and Sarah from up under Pharaoh. Here's, here's a great teaching, right? A lot of people understand. Abraham did get what he wanted from Egypt by not trusting in God. He got what he wanted from Egypt. But nobody knows that when Abraham went into Egypt, when he got what he wanted from Egypt, he also took out of Egypt what he didn't want. Anybody know that when Abraham came out of Egypt, that's where he got Hagar from. He didn't have Hagar until he went into Egypt. By not trusting God, that ran him into Egypt. While he was in Egypt, he picked up Hagar. And while he left Egypt, he took Hagar with him. Hagar was the, the kid's mom that caused him the issues. I wonder if I had never not trusted God and never not had went into Egypt, I would have never met Hagar. Sometimes we met people. <laughs> I met you at a time when I wasn't trusting in God. Picked up baggage along the way. And then you became one of the options. But if I had never went into Egypt, it would have never been one of the options because Pharaoh said, listen, when he wanted me gone, he wanted me to take everything that I had hands on, but some of his stuff was his stuff too. Now I have these things inside of my camp, things that I have picked up along the way. How many of us remember the same man Abraham was told to take his son up to the mountain and sacrifice him, one of the most popular teachers in the Bible. And when right before Abraham was getting ready to sacrifice his son, the Bible said that God stopped him and screamed out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, stop, because now that I know that you love me, and he says, uh, spare your son. He, said, he says, I know that you love me. And Abraham said when he looked up, there was a ram caught in the bush that, that he was supposed to sacrifice in the place of his son. Right there in Genesis, uh, at the 14th verse, God, God said this, that Abraham gave God a name. He says, I'm now going to call you Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh means Jehovah my provider. He taught Abraham that in a situation source, he will provide for him. So when, when, you, when you hear people get all fancy and they say, the, they start giving you the, the, the names of God. Yeah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah, Jehovah Nisi. All those fancy terms that they a lot of times use in the Pentecostal church is just different names from God. Those names of God basically represent the characteristics of God. Amen. Amen. See, God, when you say God, God is everything. That's why when he expressed himself to Moses on the yeah, mount, yeah. and he, Moses says, what should I tell him your name is? He said, because I'm a God of character. And because I'm a God of different resources, I am that I am. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I am that I am, meaning that whatever you need, you fill in the blank with that. Because I am everything. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. What is it that you need from me? What is it that you need me to be? The I am, I've taught this before, when people say I am, and you have areas in your life that you don't trust him in, those are the things that God is going to create that adversity in because we trust him in some things, not in all things. Mm -hmm. And he says, I, I, I want to be I am. I want to be everything. If I notice that there's something in your life that is cold, if there's, some, if there's a place in your life, figuratively speaking, Job knew him, but he had an area in his life where he did not trust him. An area in his life where he was fearful. One of the things Job said, Job says, the thing that I fear most has come upon me. Once God took away everything, allowed everything to be taken away from him, he said, the thing that I fear most has come upon me. Job was living a life in fear. Meaning that the, he was living like us every day. Some of us walk around every day having a fear. Fear of losing our house. Fear of losing people. Fear of it being the transmission. Fear of something wrong with the house, something wrong with the car. You walk around with that fear. 
And when you walk around with that fear, that's something that God does not like. He does not like his people walking around with fear because he says in the scripture, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but you're walking around with the spirit of fear. What is a spirit of fear? A spirit of fear is the thought of something happening. And God says, well, I got to allow that thing to be able to happen because you have something in you that I need to be able to correct. And if you're walking around with fear, I just hope it's not the trend. And guess what? Everything I hope is not, it is. Everything I hope is not, it always is. I know when that light comes on the car. Hope is not the rollers. I've been hearing them all up the street. It is the rollers. But he said he can do the brakes for 75, but the rollers going to be 400. It's going to be the rollers. I'm telling you. I always know when they say one pot gonna be 150, Mr. Smith, but the other pot gonna be 900. I always know it's gonna be the 900 dollar pot. <laughs> because my faith is activated when it's 900. Yeah. When it's 150, I got that. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You don't get it. <laughs> yeah. 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 When I'm a child of God, it's always in the greater thing, never the thing that I can handle. It's always, when I'm a child of God, it's always in the uncomfortable thing. The thing that I'm not comfortable paying is never where I'm comfortable paying. He always puts something in front of me that makes it uncomfortable. I'm always in the uncomfortable place. It's always the higher option. It's always the most difficult path. Amen. I can always tell you what it is because I'm a child of God and I always know the type of obstacles yeah. that I yeah. face and that comes up against me. Yeah. Amen. Trust the Lord all thy heart, lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall derive our path. Abraham, Abraham, as I was saying, Abraham finds out that God is a provider mm -hmm. for him. Uh, another uh, point I wanted to make as well is that um, when, God, when God brought them out of Egypt, they, they had a trust for Pharaoh, but then God needed them to be able to trust him. And so we, we know that um, God brought them to the wilderness and he fed them with manna. Manna was a type of bread, but um, Connie has given us daily breads, and where the, where, the, where the daily breads come from, you hear people talk about daily bread. The daily bread was the word of God, but though God gave them manna every day, when you look at what the word daily bread means, God knows that on every day, on, on every day you go through something and you're going to need bread. So, Every morning they woke up, God made sure that there was bread or manna there for them to take for that day. Notice God says, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow's worry about a thing for self. He says, I've given you enough bread for today. What that scripture basically means is that there's a word for you that goes along with today. So when, so when the Bible says that uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, it basically says whenever I wake up in the morning, whatever problem I have, I go through this thing that we used to go through in school where he says, listen, I need to learn to be able to fill in the blank. Fill in the blank, fill in the blank is whatever I'm going through that day, I need to find a word to be able to fill in the blank. In order to be able to fill in the blank, the Bible says I must be able to study to show myself a proof, a work one needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth is that whatever I'm going through, I have to find a scripture to be able to fill in the blank. If I find a scripture to be able to fill in the blank, I will be fed that day. So when he says, Jesus, you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that received from the mouth of God. Right then that Jesus was teaching you what's the difference between when he's talking about the bread and when, when the religious people came to Jesus, they said, Jesus, well, Moses gave us bread from heaven. Yeah. Jesus said, Moses didn't give you anything from heaven. He says, I am the bread that come down from heaven. I am the true bread. Jesus was teaching that 
That's good that you know the Old Testament. Now you understand the real bread that comes down from heaven. So when I'm telling you to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, when we have communion, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But every day he says that, do you know that a lot of people don't believe this, that every day you wake up, there's manna out there. There's a word that goes along for that day. That, see, listen, so God was trying to teach them how to trust him and how they trusted him. He says, listen, God says, when you come out in the morning, only grab enough word for that day. Mm -hmm. just, just enough word for that day. You know, people, one of the most things we teach, we say, listen, one day at a time, God says, I just need you to learn how to be able to grab enough word for that day. Whatever you're going through, find a word for that day. And then if I allow you to wake up tomorrow, if you go back out to the day, you gather more manna, a word for that day. Now, the Bible says that there were some of the Israelites who did not trust in God. And when he put bread out there for Monday, they went out there and grabbed enough word to last them to Saturday. And the Bible says that God allowed the bread that they took yes, for more than yes. one day to turn to worms. Yes. Why did God do that? He says, because you have to learn how to trust me every day. Does anybody in this store go to the grocery store every day or do you normally go for the next couple of weeks? Well, this is God saying every day go to the grocery store. Some of you go to the grocery store every day. You don't have the stuff for spaghetti, you go to get stuff spaghetti, you want to make a meatloaf. You have stuff. You, every day you want to make something, you got to go to the grocery store. Because and the reason why you do that because you didn't plan probably the day was the free time I got to go back to go to the store. Baby, cook the kids, want tacos, this and that. You don't have the stuff that you need, so you got to go back every day. <laughs> I know people say, well, that's just bad practice of the inventory. But God, somebody was thinking, well, why do we have to go out here every day and get the bread? Why don't He just put enough bread out there for the rest of the week? God is smart. Why doesn't He do that? Right? God says because. If I give you enough bread from Monday to Sunday, I wouldn't see you again till Sunday. Where do we go on Sunday and don't return again till next Sunday? So I've got enough bread today the last me till we come back here next Sunday God willing God says that's why I didn't give you all the bread at one time because I wouldn't see you again the next Sunday God says I only see some of you on Sunday let me bless you that's why I gave you problems Monday through Saturday I want to see you again. Yeah. I don't like the fact that we don't see each other enough. Yeah. So I got a lot of stuff to go wrong because you don't know how to seek me when it ain't Sunday. Yeah. Your 104.1 of your gospel songs only come on Sunday. <laughs> Some of us just clean the house to spiritual songs. Don't even go to church. On Sunday. We have time on Sunday. Even a secular radio station give us two hours yeah. of Fred Hammond. Yeah. And at nine, we're right back at the Migos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. WPGC, they give us two, three hours of Tony Lee and them trapping right back at 10. Yeah. And no more until what? Sunday. Amen. All week long, second, let me give you something on Sunday. Because we understand that the feeding of the Spirit, I don't, three hours of worship is nothing compared to the next couple of hours of days of what secular music is going to do to you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Preach. Okay, yeah. But that's how we have become. Yeah. Don't curse this Sunday. Yeah. I don't do that on Sunday. <laughs> Drug dealers. I heard so every day, day, but not on Sunday. <laughs> we still crack on Sunday too. So all week long. Now I don't do that. It's Sunday. 
God knew that. He said, you know what? I'm not giving you bread until Monday. Because you think you can keep getting this word on Sunday and I don't see you again until Sunday. He says, I need you to be able to trust me and know that when you wake up tomorrow, I'm going to have the bread, the bread back out there again. And then when you wake up Tuesday, I'm going to have the bread back out there again. If I put it out there for too many days in advance, what I'm trying to do is build trust. Because when I give you everything you need, you have a tendency to not come back until that's ran out. That's the great teaching of right there in scripture right there for the prodigal son. The prodigal son came back once he ran out. If he would have flipped that money, he would have never came back. If he would invest that money, he would have never came back. The problem is that we don't understand that, listen, what caused him to come back is when he ran out. Yeah. That's what allowed him to be able to go back. The Bible says that he ran out of all everything he had. Yeah. And then he said, you know what? Now I'm going back because I don't have anything. The Bible said that he spent all his money, wasted it on riotous living. So he says, now I'm going back. I'm going back to my father's house. Mm -hmm. Let me teach you something that God does. He never blesses you to a place where you can get too far away. That's the, that's, the, that's the blessed part about God for his people that he loves. He never blesses you to a point where you can get too far away. God knows that he has given you something that's not going to hold you. Mm -hmm. And he, he does that for a reason. He, he gives you something and it, it's not going to hold you. But at the, at the end of the day, it's going to bring you uh, right back unto him. How much time I got? Wow, time flies in. I have one more illustration I wanted to make. Going off the scripture that uh, Mashana had read, he says, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, and some trust in chariots, but I trust in the name of the Lord. Meaning God's name, meaning that when, when Jesus prayed in Matthew chapter six, and he was saying, Father, give us this day our daily bread, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The things that, the, the, uh, the benefits that come along with God's name. That's why when the Bible says, listen, when you pray, whatever you ask in my name, it shall be done. Because inside of the name of God is the will of God. And God definitely meets the need inside of that. God is teaching me, even in this time of the pandemic and what Abraham went through. God is saying, listen, my people need to learn how to be able to trust me. I'm, I know we're going through some things right now, even on my job. When we start getting slow, some of you guys may know the first thing they do, they cut your hours. They cut your hours. And then uh, there are certain things that are happening to a lot of us right now where businesses are closed. Businesses are shutting down. The waiters not getting the tips. Businesses are struggling right now. God is forcing people to come and put their trust back in him. For he know the things that we need and want before we realize. God is not telling you to sit back and try to figure out what to do. God says, I'm going to provide for you. But let me, let me explain one thing before I shut down and close. We must understand this. God knows that the love of money is the root of all evil, right? And he knows that on our money, it says, in God we trust. God, prophetically, is going to make us honor the word that's on the very money that we have. On our dollar, it says, in God we trust. So God says, if that's what you vow, let me see you turn back to me. That's, that's prophetic right there. That's what God is doing to this nation. It's, it's, it's so amazing. And I was telling Ms. Donna this on the phone yesterday. We had a conversation with her. I said, we're, we're going through a pandemic. And this is what we're doing, right? We're going through this pandemic that we believe that is man-made. That is a cop-out because that means if it's a man-made pandemic, that means that we look for man to be able to give us the solution to the pandemic. But if it's a man-made pandemic, there's no way in the world that it should be spread over the whole world if it's man-made. If this is another plague from God, that means, as I taught in Bible study on Tuesday about the fiery serpents being there, notice this in Bible study, I taught about the fiery serpents when the people of Israel were, were complaining mm -hmm. and God sent fiery serpents. Mm -hmm. And then he told Moses, listen, when, he, when after the fiery serpents bit people and he bit his people, he told Moses, he says, listen, now that they're crying out, I want you to go make a serpent of bronze. And whoever yeah. looks at that fiery serpent that you have made of bronze, they will live. Notice in the scripture of teaching, God never removed the fiery serpents. What he did is create a cure for those that were bitten 
but he never removed the fiery serpents. It's not taught that way, but the truth is, God never allowed the fiery serpents to stop. What he did is create a serpent for them to look at, for them to live. What does that mean? While we're looking for a vaccine, God is still a healer. God is still a protector. But, but God is still not removing the virus. Can I teach you that God tried before to remove it and showed us a demonstration of it and showed us that removing sin is not the answer to the problem because it comes back. The book of Genesis, when he washed the whole world. That's right. That's right. That's right. God did it. He said, I'm going to remove everything that's bad off the earth. And guess what? It all came back. You want God to wash away the virus? Me too. But he did it before, and it all came back. One thing that God cannot remove is the sin from a man's heart. That's right. Amen. If God started the world with two people and got to a place with Noah where he saved eight people, washed all them people away, and, 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 and uh, started over with, he started with two, destroyed everything, came back, started over with eight, and the world back in the same position. That means that sin is in the heart of the man. And that's what contagious, and that's what spreads. Mm -hmm. Amen. So God says, dealing with the virus is not going to change anything. I actually, and a lot of people don't want to hear teaching like this, this virus is one of the things of the tools that God is going to use to bring people to him. Mm -hmm. Amen. I know we don't want to hear that and a lot of times we don't want to hear the truth because there's a lot of pastors and ministers and preachers I see on my feed rebuking the virus hasn't gone anywhere. Rebuking cancer hasn't gone anywhere. They rebuked and cast out every sickness and disease and where has it gone? Nowhere but to the next person. Man, we're, we're, we're living in a time where we're trying to sell people healing instead of giving people salvation. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. I'd rather sell you healing than give you salvation. Yeah. Because... God forbid, if somebody gets healed under my ministry, that brings me fame. Mm -hmm. Remember, I was praying one time, and God showed you, listen, you know why I don't give you the power to heal people? Because them people will praise you for having healing hands. I didn't think about that, but God showed me. He says, Q, if you, if you had the power to lay hands on people that got healed, you know the people be following you? Mm -hmm. And then when you mess up, they're going to stop following me altogether. That's what I just said. They'll follow me for having healing hands. Yeah. But then when I mess up, they'll start following God. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I don't allow you to have certain powers. Yeah. God said the only power I'm going to give you is the power of salvation. But we all want gifts. God says gifts in the kingdom right. allow people to follow people. That's right. yeah. Salvation allows people to follow me. Amen. That's why everybody in the church want what? Gifts. He got the gift of healing. He got the gift of this. Your yeah. gift creates following, a following for you. People follow people that have gifts yeah. and don't have salvation. Amen. But they follow people that have gifts but still don't have salvation. Amen. They're just following somebody that has a gift. Yeah. Well, psychics have gifts. The woman in the book of Acts had a gift. Yeah. There's a difference in having a gift and being anointed by God. This totally because a lot of us have spiritual gifts. You have your Miss Cleo has a gift. There's the people on TV. I'm up late night working three o'clock in the morning. California psychics. They have a gift. But the Bible tells me to what? Try the spirit. By the spirit. 
Everybody who knows that I was raped and molested and been to jail is not of God. The demons know that. And you got to get hip and know that, that demons know. Come on now. Just because somebody tell you something about yourself that they're not supposed to know don't mean that they are of God. The demons are in the spiritual realm. They know those yeah. things too. Yeah. We fall in love. Right? Ain't no way he could have known that. <laughs> well, Google has told us some stuff now that we found that people weren't so prophetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not to thy own understanding. All thy ways acknowledge him, he will direct thy paths. I'm the voice pastor. Q. Thank all you guys for joining our broadcast today. We left the uh, Cash App PayPal inside of the comments. We're not asking for you guys to sow a seed to the ministry today, but if you were blessed by the ministry, we ask you to be a blessing to us. Thanking God for what he's done today. Love you guys. Have a great morning. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise. Amen. Amen.